about the reasons of our revelation. And do you, do you still remember the reason for yesterday, what we talked about the, the man who came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, offering him many things to get. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded with the verses from the Quran, from Surah Fussilat, where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is telling clearly, this is my Rasul, this is my Prophet. Do not offer him anything because I am the owner of the day of judgment. I am the owner of everything. I am the creator. I can give him whatever he wants, if he wants. And actually the second story that I'm going to share with you, and it has a verse in Surah Fussilat, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the surah, let me say to you the verse so you know what we are talking about. Allah said, وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَتِرُونَ أَنْ يَشْهَدَ عَلَيْكُمْ سَمْعُكُمْ وَلَا أَبْصَارُكُمْ وَلَكِنْ ظَنَنْتُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَعْلَمُ كَثِيرًا مِمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah said, on the day of judgment, you will not find a place to hide. So you will find your earrings, your ear, your ear and your eyesight will witness against you on the day of judgment and your skin. And not only this, you thought wrongly that maybe Allah does not know what we are saying. Allah, maybe we will do something. Allah will not pay attention to what we say. What is the reason for that ayah? Three men were talking in front of the Kaaba, three men from Quraysh were talking from the Kaaba, in front of the Kaaba. And Rasulullah was listening to them. They were saying, you know what? Maybe if we have a creator, he might hear us when we talk loudly. But definitely, definitely, he would never hear us when we talk silently. When we talk secretly, he cannot hear us. Maybe if we spoke up, we, we screamed out, he will hear us. Two of them said that. But the third one say, no, no, no. I don't think at all that he is able to hear us, whether we talk loudly or secretly. So Allah revealed that ayah responding to those three. And subhanAllah, I will add to this what Allah had mentioned in Surah Al-Mul. So Allah knows if we talk secretly and if we talk loudly, Allah hears us. But you know, there is a third dimension or there is the third and fourth dimension. Allah knows what's in our chests, what we hide. In Surah Al-Mul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the fourth dimension. Allah knows alimun bidatis sudur. That as sudur. If you said just intention, that is sudur, that would not be enough. But Allah knows your intention, what you are hiding, and what are the motives, the feelings behind your intention. Allah knows. What pushed you to feel that way? Allah knows the, th the secrets, the things that you will not even tell to yourself, tell to somebody else. Allah knows what is inside the chest, what is inside your intention. By his mercy, by his mercy, he will not hold us accountable except for what we utter. That's by his mercy. He will not hold us accountable for the bad things. That's it. Even if what you have in your chest, as long as you did not utter it, in terms of what? Bad things. But what about good? Yes. If you intended good, Allah will reward you. Even if you, like, you have seen people and, and mashallah, they are taking iftar and, and you said, what a huge reward to sponsor an iftar in Ramadan and, and as Imam Ahmed give the fatwa for 10 years of reward <laughs> of fasting in Ramadan. And that's that's right. I didn't exaggerate, by the way. So 300 people and uh, like almost like 10 years of 
Ramadan, subhanallah, or every word. And, and subhanallah, and you intended, and you said, you know what? Even that's between yourself. You didn't utter it. Inshallah, if Allah give me sustenance, give me money, give me rizq next year, I'm going to sponsor a day. If somebody intended and he died before doing this, when Ramadan comes, the angels will say to Allah, oh Allah, he's supposed to sponsor a day and nothing prevented him except that you, oh Allah, decided to take his soul. So Allah will say, write the full reward for him. By what? By just intending. And the scholar said even by, that's, that applies for the regular actions of ibadah. Like we have Brother Ashmir, Dr. Rahim, uh, uh, Dr. Zaki, Dr. Yusuf, uh, our brother Faris. They come for Maghrib, for lecture. And imagine like somebody, may Allah protect us all, somebody got sick and he couldn't come for tonight's lecture, like Brother Wajdi, for example. May Allah give him shifa. He called me and he said, I, I don't feel well today. He used to come and nothing had prevented him except the sickness. Allah will reward him as if he's, in, he's attending. That's the greatness of Allah. So he will be, and a lot, so I got this question a lot in Ramadan. You know, some people, because of the lack of the knowledge, they don't know how to, how to inter interact with the Islamic rulings. I have seen people sick in Ramadan and they are struggling. And their doctors said, do not fast. And they take it as, a, as part of taqwa and high iman. No, 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 I'm not going to break my fast. I will continue. I will not take the medicine. Yes. <laughs> of course, he will never get the reward <laughs> because he just put that uh, the lecture without paying attention. No, he would not. But I mean, imagine if the doctor told him to break his fast. You know, the, the order of the doctor in these cases, like fatwa from the imam, it's a fatwa. That's why when he comes to the imam, the imam will ask him what the doctor told you. He told me not to break the, he told me to, to break the fast and I must take the medicine. Did he tell you about bad consequences? Yes. He told me if you, if you didn't take the medicine on time, you will, you will, you will expose yourself to dangers. I will tell him the fatwa based on the opinion of the doctor. You see, the doctor and the imams are working together in the same case. I will tell him, you must listen to the doctor. You must, in this case, break your fast. No choice. Some people take it as a sign of iman, that I'm struggling and Allah will give me more. No, you can break your fast and still you will be rewarded as if you have fasted. So why you put yourself in danger? We have a statement, Allah loves you to take with the excuses exactly as he loves you to stay away from the forbidden things. Allah loves both equal. It's a this is a, a golden fit he rules. Yes, he is the owner of both. Otherwise, if he does not like it, he wouldn't legislate that subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was the first actually, or the second story that I wanted to share with you, inshallah. But there is another thing that the ayat that we recited in, in the in Salat al-Maghrib, actually it is the ayat of Surah Fussilat. Do you remember, do you still remember how Allah described the verses of the Quran? Fussilat ayatu. Made clear, extinct, clear. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, those ayat, every ayat by itself, it could resonate as a, a principle, as an Islamic ruling. But you know, that's actually what I see so interesting, and I say that always to the new Muslims. 
lots of people to look religious, they will talk to you only about the rules of Islam, what to do, what not to do. What we call it awamir wa nawahi, the commands, the prohibitions. You know the entire Quran? How many percentage of the Quran talked about the rules, what to do, what not to do? 3%. Only 3% of the entire Quran, Allah is talking about what to do, what not to do. Sometimes when we have new Muslims, oh Allah, we give them hard time. We give over their backs. Oh brother, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. You must be aware of this. It's haram, this halal, it's haram, this haram. The first day, the second day, the third day, we make them to get scary of that religion. But the, the Allah, do you want to tell me that you are careful, more careful of that religion, more than Allah himself, more than the creator? The creator Allah put all the rules in just 3%. Of the entire Quran. What about the entire Quran? The rest of the nine, 97%. It's about ethics, principles, how to deal with people, with one another, talks about the previous nations, talks about so and and can you tell me the whole da'wah of all the prophets and the messengers, it was 90%. It's about Tawheed, about Ibadah, about ethics, about principles. So why, why always to show your muscles to people talk about halal and haram? Yes, halal and haram, that's one of the pillars of that deen to stay steadfast on his, in, on his way. But sometimes we are overreacting because we do not get the message, the right message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, but some people, and that's mostly with the new Muslims, is like, oh brother, did you say shahada? Yes. You must now, now, right now, have ghusl. Take shower. Okay, can I keep the shower till I go home? No, no, no. Go to the bathroom of the masjid, right now. <laughs> what about if he made that shower after half hour when he gets back to the house. What's your problem? What's the problem? Somebody said the shahada, like without not being in the masjid. No, you must come to the masjid. Who said you must come to the masjid? No, you, you do not need to be in the masjid. Yes, it's preferable to have witnesses for you on the day of judgment, but that's a different story. Somebody watched a video on YouTube and he said the Shahada in his room while he's watching the video. And said Sayyidina Ibrahim was by himself. Inna Ibrahim akana um. He didn't bring witnesses for him. And the other one, the third one, oh, what's your name? Nick. What's your name? Uh, Jordan. What's your name? Oh, Astaghfirullah. Names of Kuffar? So what? No, you need to change yourself. Your name. Oh, you look black? You look black? Oh, so you are Bilal. That's racism. That's racism. Oh, you look muscular? Oh, you are Umar. You are Umar. You are an old man with beard? You are Abu Bakr. That's good. You have accent? You are Salman. You know? Uh, you, you, your face is reddish. It's good to have to be Suhaib. You are a young man, you are Mujahid. So we prepare you for Badr. <laughs> George. <laughs> like somebody told me, you know, somebody, his name is Girgis Muhammad Girgis. George Muhammad, Muhammad George. And he put Muhammad in the middle. You know, subhanAllah, who told you that he must, if you are talking about Islam, is the largest, the quickest religion spreading on earth. So we wanted to have Jordan Muslim. We want this. So how come I call people 
that Islam, Islamic message is a universal. Islam is addressing all people with all cultures. We, 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 we practice da'wah based on that. Then you tell me, I cannot be uh, uh, your, yes, of course, sometimes some of the, just some of the names, you must change it because it contradicts with the aqidah. Like somebody came and he declared shahada. I asked him, what's your name? He said, Christian. I said, no, that needs to be changed. <laughs> no argue about this. Huh? Yes. Like, like some of the names, yes, it, that's, and that's very, like, that's a very, like, 1%. Yes. Exactly. This is also, I'm saying, that's the message. Imagine, that's very hard even upon the parents. You are expecting the parents to, to interacting with good way with Islam. But imagine you give the name of your son to your son and all of a sudden you find your son went like half hour to the masjid. Then he came back with another name different than the name that you give to him. Automatically, as parents, they will hate Islam. But when he comes to convert and the first message after Tawheed, you tell him, you have parents? Yes. Give my salam to them. Do good to them. Honor them. And if you can bring them so they can eat with us, I am, as the Imam, I am inviting. We have brother here. His mom is not Muslims, is not Muslim, and she she cooks desserts for us, appreciating what we have done with her son because he became, mashaAllah, nice. He became obedient to his mother. This is the message that we, we want. Even if she didn't convert yet, but see the message that we, that, that she got, subhanAllah. And I'm always giving this, the, the, the example of the, our sister, mashaAllah. And now she's a, a public figure, mashaAllah. Sister Elizabeth, mashaAllah. She's the wife of Imam Jalal. Now, how did she convert to Islam? Her, 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 her son. When he came, her son, Kaden, and he declared Islam, and he changed it completely. I found one day that she opened the door, coming, and her face, the expression was like, like, like angry. And she said, are you the Imam? He said, yes. What did you make to my son? He said, what did he make? Maybe he did something wrong. Am, am I in trouble? I said, what happened? She said, he completely changed it. He became so nice, polite, and good boy. I wanted to know what's the secret. I said, the secret is Islam. She said, I want to be Muslim. And she converted. That was the reason. And mashallah, now she's spreading knowledge. She's making, you know, uh, uh, appointments, events with the, with the brothers and sisters. She's, she's spreading Islam and she is the wife of our Imam, and, and Alhamdulillah, look at the goodness behind all of this. This is the message. So, why I brought this idea? Because Allah said in Surah Fussilat, "Waman ahsanu qawlan, min man daa ila Allah, wa amila saliha, wa qala innani min al Muslimin." You know, every time when I recite this ayah. I remember the head of the department of the Islamic studies in English in Al Azhar University, Dr. Abu Leila, Dr. Muhammad Abu Leila. He was my professor. He passed away, I think, in 2021, maybe. And uh, he is the head of the department. He was teaching me in Al Azhar University. And every time, he, he used to explain that ayah very well. Let me give you the translation. Allah said, who is, who is in my creation better than the one who is delivering the da'wah and acted righteously and he said, I am one of the Muslims. Who will be better than him on the day of judgment? 
who will be better than a person who is conveying the da'wah to Allah means in the good way. Imagine, imagine the goodness that you will have if you delivered the da'wah in a good way. This is, yes, you are imitating, following the footsteps of the, the same mission of the prophets and the messengers of Allah. That's why we have the hadith. Rasulullah said, the prophets, the messengers, did not leave behind as inheritance, coins, dirham, money. They didn't leave money behind as inheritance, but they left the knowledge. That's the inheritance of the prophets and the messengers. Then Rasulullah said, فَمَنْ أَخَذَهُ Whoever got the knowledge, أَخَذَ بِحَظٍ وَافِرٍ Means he got all the goodness in this dunya and in the hereafter. Why? Because you are following the same mission of the best of the creation of Allah. If you still remember the, the, the message that I gave last Jumu'ah about how we sometimes we interact with the da'wah. You remember... Uh, Sayyidina Harun, when the people worship the cow, did he stop them? Why? Yes. yes, because he said, people were so angry, if I were to talk, they will kill me. I will create a fitna. I will split the community. So what did he make? And that's another Islamic rulings. That's another Islamic ruling. Lots of people might create problems. Even wallahi, they will hate. They will make people to hate Islam. They will make people to hate the masjid. They will make people to hate the salah. They will make people to hate the way of Allah. And those people, by the way, because of their ignorance, they don't care about you. They don't care. In reality, they don't care. They just wanted to be big mouth. Claiming that we are defending the religion of Allah and and no matter I don't care about if they followed or not followed I don't care if they applied uh he he thinks oh I have the truth and I have to say the truth here Harun did not stop the munkar because the Islamic ruling Imam Ibn al-Qayyim said وَإِذَا كَانَ إِنْكَارُ الْمُنْكَرِ يَتَرَتَّبُ عَلَيْهِ مُنْكَرٌ أَعْظَمَ مِنْ فَلَا تُنْكِرُ الْمُنْكَرِ Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's historically happened. So what's the Islamic ruling? If you are going to stop the, the, the haram thing, but stopping that by this way might lead it to something bigger or to be worse, do not stop it. For example, you want to tell, talk to your son about your son is not making salah, is not praying. Salah is the pillar of Islam, the main pillar. But you know yourself that you are going to attack him in such a way that you might, you might make him or push him to leave Islam altogether. In this case, do not talk. But Imam, what about Salah? Do not talk. Somebody will take care of it. Don't, do not talk. You, we talked on, on Tuesday with Imam Jalal. Yes. And Imam Hisham. It's a sign of Iman when you keep silent. You know, sometimes we have people they cannot remain silent. They feel like they are get pushed. No, remain silent. It is an act of worship in Islam. Because if you open your mouth, you might lead to disaster. Don't talk. Whoever believes in Allah and the day of judgment, let him speak good or remain silent. 
So two choices. Lots of Sahaba did this. They stayed away from the fitna. They said, we will not talk. We will not talk. We have a hadith. I don't want to take that for, for long, but we have a hadith. It says, by the time of fitna, keep silent and stay away from people. Even if you will come to the trunk of a palm tree, hold to it and stay there. Even you will like to, to stop your tongue from talking, even you will bite the trunk of the trunk of the palm tree. And we said last Jumu'ah, how many years Rasulullah stayed and he didn't destroy the, the idols? 21 years. 13 years in Mecca and 8 years in Medina. 21 years. And I want you just think about this. Put the two pictures. Rasulullah waited 21 years. 21 years. Have sabr. And he has 360 idols around the Kaaba. He waited 21 years so he can come with a little stick to push it. But he destroyed the idols first in their hearts. And he slightly changed the aqidah instead of attacking people and lose them. Put that picture, and on the other side, just imagine Ibrahim السلام, taking the axe, going to the idol, smashing all of them. Oh, <laughs> yes, he was young, and, and he is holding the axe in the biggest one oh, oh, on his neck. Did he earn something? Did he earn something? Did Ibrahim السلام, earn anything from smashing the idols? He got angered. And they, you know, there is a, there is a narration said, They stayed one month to collect the wood to, to flame a fire. Can you imagine the anger? They, they wanted to make a big scenario out of it. And they couldn't even get him close to the fire uh, they wanted to put him on something and well, what we call it al manjani they they put him on that machine so he can be yeah caterpillar to be thrown in the fire just because they cannot get around we have another narration said what tayru even the birds cannot fly over the fire otherwise it will be burned subhanallah so this is this is the message. Put those two pictures. So the ayah that I wanted you to have today, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better than a person who is practicing da'wah? And why Allah chose da'wah? Because this is one, or this is the, the mission of the best of the creation of Allah. And yes, you know, it's like, like without any, but without any offense, sometimes you trade on something, you buy and sell, right? Like if, if, I, if I am selling rice, Brother Ashmir came and he took five pounds of rice from me. Do I have to, to talk with him too much? Do I have to care about if he is a good servant of Allah or not? No. He will give me the money even if he was stealing the money. It's not haram upon me. Uh, I don't care. If he got it from a halal source or a haram source, he came and he took the rice and he went. But you know the da'wah is to change the hearts and minds. This is the most difficult part. Da'wah is not to deliver the message. No. Otherwise, Allah would reveal the Quran one shot to Rasulullah and he would bring good gathering and slaughter 10 cows or and 10 camels. Bring all the people of Quraysh. Let them eat and say to them, you know what? Listen to the Quran. And he gives the entire Quran one shot. Alhamdulillah, 
I delivered the da'wah. Now I fulfilled my mission. Assalamu alaikum. And he goes. <laughs> is that is that the da'wah? Da'wah is to change the heart by the grace of Allah. Is to work on delivering the da'wah in such a way so Allah would help you. Without Allah, you cannot, you cannot change anything. But we, with the help of Allah, by the grace of Allah, the guidance come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the end, you need to change the hearts and the minds and the traditions. Even, you know, lots of people might die. Why Abu, why Abu Talib didn't accept Islam? What was his point? No, that he got the message from Rasulullah. Yes. He refused Islam from Rasulullah. The one he used to defend him. He said, In kultuha ayyaratni al-Arab. If I were to say it, the Arabs will make fun of me after my death. So he didn't accept the Islam because of the tradition. So tradition can cause somebody to be in the hellfire. But actually you do in the da'wah, you try by the grace of Allah to change the hearts, the minds, the traditions and everything to the right way, to the way of Allah, which is, which is not something easy at all. That's why do not expect like results, like sometimes you might have a father, Imam, talk with my son. Okay. So the Imam talks with him like half an hour. The next day, Imam, he didn't get changed. Uh, Allah, <laughs> Imam, you didn't do a good, a good job. Astaghfirullah. Musa alayhi salam, Musa. He had the, the, the magic stick, as we call it. <laughs> he had the stick and he couldn't convince Fir'aun. And he is the messenger of Allah. Do, do I have a magic stick? No. Subhanallah. May Allah guide us to the right path. Allahumma ameen ya rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Next week, inshallah, we are going to continue our journey with Surah Fusilat. Still, we have lots of things to talk about. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته